Hi, welcome to another edition of the Alan Rosenberg Show. You know what time it is. It's going to be the final episode of the year of Time Capsule. That is, again, one of my favorite series that I do. And I choose a year and I show you, um, I tell you how many albums I have from that year. I show you a good selection of them and then I choose the top 10 uh, of my favorites. And I do one video per year. This is the 20th episode of Time Capsule. So I started... As you can see, these are the years. Now, this is 2024, so this year I did 74, 84, 94, 2004, and this video is 2014. So there you go. Go to Playlists, and you'll see a playlist called Favorite Albums by Year Time Capsule. And feel free, check out whatever year you want. It'll bring you back in time, show you a big chunk of albums that came out that year, and my favorites. And... What's happening is you're getting my basic history of rock and roll. So I hope you like these series. Let's go back in time to 2014. Now, if you watch these videos, you're going to see, like, the last one I had, like, 130 albums or something like that that came out that year. What you'll see is, as it gets closer to modern times, so now we're talking 10 years ago, I only have 42 albums that came out in 2014. Why? Because the bands that I mostly love, they just are not prolific anymore. You know, when you go back in time, I was getting, you know, you know, well over 100 albums per year. So uh, I only own 42 albums that came out in 2014. I'm going to show you 30 of them, and then we'll end with the top 10. Um, all right, so before we do that, let's show you some box sets. There's some really good box sets that came out in 2014, <coughs> which you can see here. This was a legendary tour, Crosby, Stills, Nash & Young 1974 tour, and they played stadiums, which was really unique at that time. And this is quite the box set <coughs> that came out. Four discs and a huge book. <clears throat> and that's what it looks like. So if you like Crosby, Stills, and Nash, and you never saw this, this is three CDs and a DVD, and it really covers uh, that tour. There was a lot of, like, unreleased stuff that they were doing at that time as well. Talk about involved box sets. Look at this one. This is Nils Lofgren, Face the Music. I actually have a playlist on favorite box sets, and I did a video on this, because this is huge. This has got nine CDs and a DVD. So if you want to cover Nils Lofgren, you know, from Grin through the solo years, this is quite the box set with a beautiful booklet, came with an autographed photo. Um, so this is a great box. Face the Music from Nils Lofgren came out in 2014. Love that box. Um, usually when it comes to the bootlegs here, some Dylan, I'll get like the two CD version. But every once in a while I want the mega boxes. And this is the mega box version of the Basement Tapes. Why? Because I'm a big fan of the band, and I thought I would really do a deep dive. The reality is, you probably don't need all of this stuff. It's just so many versions, and and uh, a lot of it is pretty low fidelity. But, uh, what the hell, six discs, uh, I'm glad I have it. The Basement Tapes Complete, from the bootleg series from Bob Dylan, came out that year as well. And if that wasn't enough, on this side, we had Pink Floyd, and they released uh, a new album, quote-unquote, The Endless River, mostly instrumental stuff uh, from the Division Bell time. Um, not a Pink Floyd album that I go too much, but I'm glad I have it. And then when you get the box, it had a Blu-ray, so I could listen to it in 5.1 sound, you know, and a hardback book and a bunch of photographs. And uh, can you see that? Some photographs that came in there and a little hardback book. Uh, not essential, but, you know, being kind of a completist, yeah, I had to get it. And I'm a huge fan of the Division Bell song. And then look at this huge box that came out. And this was the Who Quadrophenia Live in London. And it's a plastic container that's got a headlight. <laughs> Gotta love that. From the scooter and this thing is just uh loaded this is from the live performances of quadrophenia and this is a five disc set um with a whole bunch of stuff the the cds the blu-ray of the concert two cd set the blu-ray of the concert um but then the highlight for me is that last disc and that is the 1973 quadrophenia album 
in 5.1 surround sound on Blu-ray. It was worth the price of admission for that alone because uh, that's my favorite Who album and really uh, way up there as far as one of my all-time favorite albums of all time by anybody. So there you have it. Those are the box sets that were my highlights from 2014. Let's show you some of my other favorite albums that came out that year that didn't go top 10 or notable albums. Uh, Ian Anderson put out Homo Eraticus. Now, there you go. Here's my Ian Anderson uh, concert t-shirt. You know I'm a huge Jethro Tull fan and Ian Anderson fan. And Homo Eraticus, uh, beautiful packaging, hardback with two discs. And this um, had a 5.1 DVD. So I'm into that 5.1 surround sound stuff. And just a beautiful book with lyrics and the whole story. For whatever reason, and I have to go back to it, this album just never totally grabbed me. Uh, and I'm a big Ian Anderson solo fan. I'm sitting there, I um, love Zella Jean as a toll record, whatever. Rock Flute was good too. Uh, this, for whatever reason, I just, uh, I guess it was just overlooked. I'll have to go back to it. Uh, let me know if I'm missing something, because this album just didn't totally grab me. What did grab me was in 2014, he put out this, and this is... Thick as a Brick Live in Iceland, and this is a two-CD set, and I thought this is an amazing tour. He toured and he did the original Thick as a Brick in its entirety, which is something they hadn't done since like 1973, because when they play Thick as a Brick tall, even in their golden days, they do like a 10, 12-minute version. Here's the whole album in its entirety, took a break, and then they came back and they did Thick as a Brick 2 in its entirety, and if you know my channel, I am a huge fan of Thick as a Brick 2. I think it's a masterpiece, and I think it should have actually, now in retrospect, he should have put it out as a Jethro Tull album, because it's fantastic, I think. And uh, he also put it out as a, uh, this is a Blu-ray disc of it, a DVD version of it. Uh, same show, uh, Thick as a Brick and Thick as a Brick 2. Um, if you've never heard Third Thick as a Brick 2, I, it's in some of my other videos. I, I think it's fantastic. Antigone Rising, they put out Whiskey and Wine, Volume 1. This is more of an EP, but it's like five songs, but it's excellent. And I've spoken about Antigone Rising a lot on my channel. And let's keep going. Asia put out Gravitas. Uh, this is the deluxe edition, uh, limited CD, DVD version. Um, you know, as you know, I'm a fan of Asia, um, the original band, you know, and that's what they did here. They kind of... You know, when they had reformed, I was kind of excited about it. And, um, you know, but this one was not the four original guys. Now they already started splitting up. And you got John Wetton on this and Carl Palmer and Jeffrey Downs. But Steve Howe is now gone. And they had a guy named uh, Sam Calson who was very good. But uh, not essential, you know. But it's, it's a good release. If you like Asia, you know, and you're kind of a completist like me, yeah, you can get it. But not essential now i'm a huge fan of blondie i love blondie and this album that came out in 2014 is historic for me because in my whole collection of 5000 plus albums this may be one of my most hated albums of all time and this is an album they put out called ghosts of download terrible packaging but they were smart because they put it in a box along with Greatest Hits, Deluxe, Redux. Um, this is before Taylor Swift was doing that. Uh, I guess they had licensing issues and they weren't making money. So they decided to re-record uh, a lot of their classic songs. I have no use for that. If I'm going to listen to classic Blondie songs, I'm going to listen to the original versions. But they put out a CD in here of re-recorded versions. The reason why... This is an essential box is because of this. They did put in on DVD, Blondie Live at CBGB's in 1977. Now you're talking, right? This is an amazing DVD. Great set list, great performance. And as far as I know, the only way to get it is in this box of this album called Ghosts of Download, which I think is not only one of the... Not only the worst Blondie album of all time, it's one of the worst albums I own. And the reason why, it was an experimental album, and I love that about Blondie, that they experiment. 
But this is like an electronic album. They have one of the greatest drummers, in my opinion, of all time. Uh, a crucial part of the band, Clem Burke. And Clem Burke is missing in action on this album. Purposely, they just didn't want him, to, you know, on this because they wanted to do this electronic stuff. Less said about this album, the better. Uh, Ghosts of Download. I'm just showing it to you. Now, Charlie Daniels put out an album that year called Off the Grid, Doing It Dylan. And typically, I'm not the biggest fan of, you know, like cover version albums. But this is a really good listen. If you like Charlie Daniels' band, he really does heartfelt Dylan covers. And they go back because Charlie Daniels was really discovered by Bob Dylan as a studio musician in Nashville when he was doing Nashville Skyline. And Charlie played on his album. So uh, they do have a history together. Marianne Faithful put out Give My Love to London. Uh, another fine release, you know. Uh, she's always solid. If you like her, I enjoy her, you know, co-writers, her voices, what it is. But obviously she is the real deal, and this was a fine record. This was an interesting one from Peter Frampton, Hummingbird in a Box. Um, it's it's eight, seven songs. It's not really a full-length album. It's largely instrumental. Um, it's kind of called Songs for a Ballet. Um, but it's good. You know, Peter is such a great guitarist. Uh, not essential at all. If you like Peter Frampton, you don't have to run and get it. But it's good. Uh, this is Latter-day John Mellencamp. He out, put out the album Plain Spoken. Um, you know, he he kind of, as he got older, got very dignified, uh, less commercial. But certainly the real deal. Love the artwork on this. You know, it looks like those old kind of mid-60s albums, um, but it's a good release from John Mellencamp. I've become a big fan over the years of Joan Osborne, and it's another solid record from her, uh, Love and Hate. Uh, pretty lush, good production on this album, uh, and good songs. As I said, I've become a, a big fan of hers over the last couple of years. Now, Robert Plant, I have so much respect for, and I've talked about it, the fact that he pursues in it incredibly diverse solo career when he could easily get hundreds of million dollars in his own pocket to just tour as Led Zeppelin, and he doesn't do that. So I really appreciate it, and I love especially his early solo career I still listen to. The latter-day stuff kind of becomes what happens with a lot of artists um, where they just re keep releasing albums, and they're real solid, but they, in my mind, they just they don't really stand out. out. And they just kind of merge into the other. And that's what I had with this one. Lullaby and the Ceaseless Roar. Another fine release. Um, but it's just not something that I really go back to that much. But he, listen, he is a great artist. And um, that's for sure. Now, Bob Seger put out a new album that year called Ride Out. This was the deluxe edition. Uh, not exactly a prolific artist. And kind of an event when he put out the album, but like a lot of his latter day ones, I just thought it was just okay. You know, it's nothing special, um, at least to me. Um, and there it is. So, Bob Seeger, and that was the songs that were on there, and um, had Detroit made on there. Right out from Bob Seeger, just okay. This was a great find that came out that year. I had this recorded this concert when it was aired on WLIR radio when Peter Tosh played at my father's place in 1978. I had it on 8-track and I loved it. Then eventually got rid of my 8-tracks. So when this came out on CD, I jumped at it and I loved this concert. This is Peter Tosh live at my father's place in 1978. Uh, around the time of Bush Doctor and a really great performance. I love Peter Tosh, and that was a great one. Um, two more here. We got Jack White put out a solo record, Lazaretto. And Steve Harold talked about the White Stripes, and I totally agree with him. I like the White Stripes. I think they're a really unique band. Jack White is obviously a massive talent. But then I always shake my head. Just, Why do I never really have the desire to listen to the White Stripes? And that was my reaction with this album. Massive talent. Glad I got it when I played it. Really enjoy it, but I just don't really go to it. Lucinda Williams, uh, big fan of hers, uh, especially her earlier albums I think are amazing. As she's gone on, I've also gotten a little bit weird, uh, worn down a little bit, uh, a little bit samey. But this album was the first album she did, <coughs> excuse me, on her own 
record label, and she went all out, man. This was a double disc, a double CD, and it's loaded. It's a very long album, which is maybe the problem that I had. It's called Down Where the Spirits Meet the Bone. Um, I think for me, if I took the best tracks and made it a single album, it would have been stronger. But, you know, she's the real deal and a really good collection, good value for money. This thing is loaded. So, what were the top 10 albums for me of 2014? At number 10 was Wishbone Ash. And, uh, you know, I'm a, a huge fan of the band. But I was really, when I talk about my favorite of Wishbone Ash, it's those classic years. I take my hat off to Andy Powell, the original member. He has carried that band throughout. I always saw see them live. Every time he releases an album as Wishbone Ash, I buy it. But it's always the same reaction. The Wishbone Ash has a band. The problem they had was they never really had a great vocalist. Martin Turner, the bass player, really was the lead vocalist. But Andy would sing. The other guitarist, Ted Turner, or Lori Warsford, would sing. And it would mix up the album really well, and then they would sing in harmony. Ever since, when Andy Powell's been carrying on the band, he's the sole singer in the band. And as he's a great, nice guy. I've met him. He always signs my stuff. I buy all their albums, but their albums get very samey in the latter-day Wishbone Ash. So if you're not a fan, don't start with a latter-day Wishbone Ash album. Go for those classics. They have much more variety. Um, but, you know, this for the latter-day Wishbone Ash with Andy Powell singing all the songs is a good one. Blue Horizon came out in 2014. This one's got a deluxe edition with some bonus tracks. Um, this one does have a couple of songs that really stand out. Uh, one in particular is called Way Down South. He always plays that live. Way Down South, to me, is a classic Wishbone Ash song. When I do a compilation of their classic stuff, Way Down South from this album would be on it. But this is a strong Wishbone Ash album. If you're a big fan, definitely recommend it. If you're a newbie, no, go with the classic stuff. Uh, number nine was this one, Rick Wakeman. Um, this was an archive release. 1975, Life at the Empire Pool, King Arthur on Ice. Now, this is a legendary concert. He did King Arthur, which is my favorite Rick Wakeman solo record, on ice at Wembley Arena with ice skaters on a big, full production. And I was like, it, it's a kind of concert that everybody, when you read, makes fun of. But I was like, Rick Wakeman's got balls the size of Godzilla. I mean, for him to put up his money and do that, and lose money on it i was like you're the man and i always wanted to see it and they finally released it and this is a cd and more importantly a dvd of that performance and rick i loved it loved it this is a great thing if you like progressive rock and you like rick wakeman king arthur and the knights of the round table is fantastic and seeing it on dvd and listening to it mm, loved it number nine Number eight, Leonard Cohen released uh, what would be his second last record, um, and that was Popular Problems. And um, this was interesting. This is produced by Patrick Leonard, the guy who worked with Madonna for a long time in her heyday, and he co-wrote and produced it. And it really, really works. You know, Leonard's voice at this time, he's aged and, you know, it's really raw and more speaking than singing. But the music accompaniment is great. You know, the lyrics are always great. What was it on Slow? The opening track is like, you know, uh, you want to get there first and I want to last, you know, kind of a thing. Um, and uh, what was on here? Samson in New Orleans about Hurricane Katrina. Um, that was really good, almost like a gospel number. What else was on here? Did I Ever Love You? That was an interesting run. He, he really tries to sing on that one. Um, uh, and it works and then all of a sudden it almost becomes like a disco beat with patrick landed and then almost country-ish a lot of sounds on this it ends really nicely with you got me singing beautiful vocal with violin this is a really strong latter day leonard cohen album which is why it's at number eight number seven is the band fish and um i'm a fan and uh this is a really good one i like this one this was called fuego and this one is a bit more on the commercial side in a good way you know, if you're not a overly jam person, I'm one of the few people who loves Grateful Dead studio records. And it reminds me of that. This is would be a good Grateful Dead studio record. It's a good Fish studio record. Fuego's really funky. Um, you know, the line's really good. Devotion to a Dream, Halfway to the Moon. It's got some goofy stuff. Wombat is on there. It's goofy. Wingsuit. 
Uh, Waiting All Night, that was a really good one. That's a moody one, I remember. Good, good record for sure from Fish, which is why I have it at number seven. At number six, Steve Hackett. He started doing the Genesis Revisited at that time, and I was thrilled because that's Genesis that I love. And he's got an extraordinary band, great singer, and he would start digging deep and do all these Genesis Revisited concerts. And this is two CDs and a DVD of the show. Great light show. This is live from the Royal Albert Hall. And this is something he still does to this day. And when he tours in the States, I go see it. Now he does full albums, which is really cool. But this one is really nice because uh, it's just a mixture of classic Genesis and some great solo stuff, um, you know, for me, when I listen to this music, the early Genesis and Steve Hackett's live versions, I go to heaven, man. This is just the greatest music of all time and uh, was genius on Steve Hackett's part that he would carry the torch because Genesis doesn't play that stuff at all uh, then. Number five. I always talk about live albums doing their job, and this one sure did. I love a, live, a great live album is a perfect way to get into a band, and that's what I did here, Blackberry Smoke. Leave a Scar, live, North Carolina. This was my first Blackberry Smoke album. No booklet or anything, but more importantly, a smoking performance. They are carrying the torch of Southern Rock in a big way, and it's great. And then from this, I went and got the studio records, and to this day, every time they release something, I buy their new albums, and they're terrific. Blackberry Smoke, carrying the torch of Southern Rock. And that was at number five, Leave a Scar. Number four, Chrissy Hine released her solo record called Stockholm, and I didn't know what to expect going into this, uh, although the album before this was Fidelity, which is one of my favorite Chrissy Hine, you know, uh, albums, including Pretenders albums, and I was pleasantly surprised. This is a terrific album, and yeah, to me, this is a solo record. It does not sound like the Pretenders. The production is kind of strange. Uh, it's very... It almost sounds to me like there's a blanket over the album. It just has like an eerie kind of a sound quality. But the songs are great. Um, I think this was a much better album than the last couple of Pretenders albums at that time, which was Loose Screw and Break Up the Concrete. This was far superior for me. You or No One. Adding the Blue, the last song, oh my God, is just like incredible. Her, her phrasing and her voice. I could listen to her sing anything, but great songs like she has on this album, uh, especially Adding the Blue, You and No One, really good. Uh, Chrissy Hart at number four. At number three was Bruce Springsteen and High Hopes. This was a mishmash. A lot of people did not like this album. A lot of people make fun of this album. They're like, what the hell is the point? And the point is he put out an album, and it had a lot of covers. It had a couple of re-recordings. But the main thing about this album is that this is the album we did with Tom Morello, the guitarist from Rage Against the Machine, one of the greatest guitarists you'll ever hear in your life. And he took the E Street Band, when he played with them live and in an Australian tour, I went and got a whole bunch of bootlegs from another Australian tour because he took them to a level that was not to believe. You know, you take a guy of his quality and the way he plays lead guitar and you put them in an E Street Band as great as the E Street Band was and I always said they possibly the greatest band ever he took them to another level and you hear it on this album you know he's just extraordinary and you know did Springsteen need to redo American Skin 41 Shots maybe not but he does it with Morello and the greatest thing on here the Ghost of Tom Joad uh is one of the greatest pieces of music by anybody at any time. It's it's way up at the top of my favorite Springsteen songs, and Tom Morello just takes it. You 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 levitate. You see God. It's a an incredible performance. But this isn't a really good record. There's you know the title trap is a really rousing opener, and Tom Morello plays really strong on it. What's that one? Down in the Hole is a really moody kind of a track, kind of like I'm on fire. This is an album that the sum is greater than the parts. It just works really well, and it's an underrated Springsteen album. At number two, talk about underrated albums, is Tom Petty and Hypnotic Eye. Kind of like, uh, you know, I, I, I don't ever think of Tom Petty as my all-time favorite artist up there, but he really is. I have every album. Every album is great. And even his lo underwhelming albums like Echo and uh, Mojo, they're all so really good. She's the one... 
And when I got this album, I had no expectations. And I was like, God damn, this is just another great album. And I wound up playing this album all the time. It's got a really wide soundscape. There's just a lot. You know, it's such, there's such a great band. You know, you know, we talk about guitar weaving and the Stones talk about guitar weaving. Listen to the Heartbreakers. Listen to, um, what's that song on here? Uh, Fault Lines, the second song. Listen to Mike Campbell's licks. His guitar licks are just extraordinary. And the way he weaves with Tom Petty, it's fantastic. Absolutely fantastic. Um, what's that song here? Full Grown Boy. That was like a jazzy number. Um, Sins of My Youth was this really ethereal kind of moody track. Uh, and, then, and then it ends at the end with like, you know, Shadow People, another great rocker. This is a really underrated record. Uh, is it as good as Damn the Torpedoes, Hard Promises? No. But is it great? Yeah. Number one album of the year, U2 and Songs of Innocence. This album got destroyed when it came out. Uh, all this controversy, I, you know, I think it was uh, iPad, Apple made a deal with them, and anybody who got an iPad got the album for free, and people were up in arms. And I was like, what the hell are you up in arms about? You're getting the free U2 album. Guaranteed it's going to be really good, and if you don't like it, delete it. But, you know, people just have, like, this mob mentality, like it's the end of the world. I never understood it. But that didn't help, and U2 is always the band to hate because uh, of the way they are, you know, trying to, they're so big and they speak and with presidents and all of that. But what you got to remember is the most important thing is the band and the music. And this album is extraordinarily great. It's got some electronic elements that kind of hark back to, like, pop. But the problem with pop was it didn't have a lot of great songs. This one does, and they toured for this. And you what? And you're like, these songs hold up to to any of their classics. You know, um, every breaking wave and California and song for someone and Iris and raised by wolves, Cedarwood Road. These songs are incredible. Yeah, incredible. This is a great with a capital G. U2 album, which means it's a great album. And it was my number one album of the year. This was the deluxe edition. And it's got you some bonus tracks. Not essential. So there you have it. Songs of Innocence at number one. So there you go. Let's recap them. Number one, U2, Songs of Innocence. Number two, Hypnotic Eye from Tom Petty and the Heartbreakers. At number three, let's stick it over there. High Hopes from Bruce Springsteen. Number four, Chrissy Hind, Stockholm. At number five, doing what a great live album should do. And that is going to be Leave a Scar from Blackberry Smoke. At number six, get up there, Pink Floyd. At number six, we're going to have none other than Steve Hackett. Oh, fuck it. The hell with it. At number six, we got Steve Hackett with Genesis Revisited live at the Royal Albert Hall. At number seven, we got Fuego from Fish. I love all these albums falling down, right, Dave? All right, let's keep going. At number eight, no, you knew that was going to happen. Let's keep going. Number eight, we got Leonard Cohen and Popular Problems. Another really strong record from him. At number nine, yeah, my pet release, I don't care, I love it. Rick Wakeman, Live at the Empire Pool, King Arthur on Ice, check it out. At number ten, Wishbone Ash with Blue Horizon. Why don't they make CDs anymore? They make these, like, uh, Digipax things. I hate them. Hate them. They don't stand up. All right, there you have it, folks. I uh, hope you enjoyed this video. hope it brought you back in time to some great music that maybe you forgot about. And let me know what your favorite albums of 2014 were. Um, I actually think it's a pretty strong year, to be honest with you. It's not a bad year at all. Um, so let me know what you think. Uh, as always, if you're new to my channel, hit subscribe. Don't forget, this is a history of rock and roll year by year. Go to albums by best albums, favorite albums by year, time capsule, and you'll revisit that year in a nice, concise manner. As always, thanks so much again. Hope you have a great weekend, and I'll see you next time on the Alan Rosenberg Show.